everyone see my my screen? Yeah, looks great. Okay, good. So thank you very much for um, to the organizers of the NFU uh, University to uh, for this invitation because I know that the original schedule uh, was supposed to end a week earlier. So or since the last uh, or last round of uh, conferences. So, um, so thank you for accommodating me <laughs> for this round. Um, so today my talk will, will, will be about uh, the wonderful world of uh, fake meats. Um, and I'm going to say a few things before I get into the topic, but because uh, as a sociologist, I'm interested in asking questions about how society makes sense of technologies uh, like fake meats um, how plant-based or cellular meats or animal or edible animal tissues uh, produced in the laboratory, um, what these things signify and what they tell us about where we're at as, in terms of a society. So what is the future that is projected um, by these technologies in terms of uh, the future of farming, the future of food? Are, are these um, technological developments inevitable? Uh, who benefits from them? Who doesn't? Uh, do they produce or reproduce inequalities in the food system? Uh, if so, for whom? Will they save the planet? Which is another question because we're very much concerned about eating in the context of the Anthropocene. So what I'll try to do uh, is to offer some critical reflections uh, about these issues because they are transformative um, and also because they affect all of us uh, as eaters, but of course, also as farmers. Of course, I'm not a farmer. My aim today is really to provide you with some basis for a broader discussion. So I'm not offering up any kind of point of view or opinion uh, I'm going to try and sort of be um, present, you know, both sides of the arguments. As a former molecular geneticist, um, having worked in plant and animal cell tissue culture, um, I also have a particular perspective of understanding the processes that go into cultivating these tissues in the laboratory. And for me, that raises a lot of questions from a food safety point of view from a nutritional point of view, from an ethical point of view as well. I should also say that when I was working in a laboratory and I was working with these um, cell tissue cultures, um, I never thought for one second that one day we would be eating these things. So the, the whole process of making these things edible is itself a very interesting uh, process. So, Today, my discussion, the, the, the way that I've organized the discussion um, is that I will talk about, um, sorry, uh, what, what um, all the alternative protein landscape uh, really is. Uh, are we really going to a world uh, with no animal uh, agriculture? I'll focus specifically on plant-based uh, meats. Uh, and then I'll focus on cellular agriculture. And cellular agriculture, which is a, a sort of new terminology, um, covers two types of uh, processes. One is fermentation using uh, uh, yeast or using bacteria to produce non-living organic molecules, um, such as uh, the kinds of molecules that go into the formulation of uh, non-animal meats, and whenever I say meats, it's always in quotations. Um, and some of these products um, are like molecules like casein, gelatins, fats, um, albumins. And um, <clears throat> they also go into the production of um, other non-meat products or non-animal products, such as milk, dairy, cheeses, and so on. And then the second um, aspect of cellular agriculture, which I will be focusing on, is really what I call, or what is called cell-based. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the part of the cellular agriculture that takes up tissue engineering in order to produce and assemble edible animal tissues. 
And then of course, uh, I will raise some questions about fake meats, uh, questions about the environmental sustainability uh, of these meats, but also um, broader questions, uh, more practical questions possibly about, um, about these, um, these new developments in the food uh, landscape. So what are we talking about when we're talking about um, alt proteins or alternative proteins? We're talking about four different categories of uh, proteins. We're talking about insect-based. We're talking about proteins produced from algae, fungi, fungi, and um, mushrooms. Uh, we're talking about plant-based and cell-based. So these are the last two categories that I will be discussing. Uh, I'm not going to talk about insect-based because um, Although there's been a lot of discussion about insect-based proteins, it hasn't had the take up that, um, that maybe, and it, is, it could be because it's insects and people aren't interested in eating insects, I don't know. Um, and then the other one, uh, the algae, fungi, and mushroom uh, is a whole other, whole other topic. So I'll just focus my discussion on plant-based and cell-based um, fake meats or meats. So, um, the imitation of meat um, is nothing new using non-animal products. There have been all kinds of uh, fake meats in the past like uh, that use tempeh or tofu or even corn with a Q. Um, these new fake meats, however, um, are different because they, they benefit from highly sophisticated science to make them look and feel um, and possibly taste uh, realistic. So the term alt protein refers to all the protein sources um, that are not obtained from animals. And um, it seems to uh, it seems to indicate that the market, sorry, seem to indicate that there's a growing interest uh, in non-traditional animal proteins for human consumptions. Um, so I'll be uh, talking about two things. I, be, I mean, I should say two things before I, I get going. The first of all is the, the use of language is very contested and debated. The use of the terms meat, sausage, burgers, etc., milk, cheese, or butter, or even dairy uh, to describe these products is highly controversial. And I'll, get I'll, I'll discuss this at the end of the talk as well. And of course, it's being it's being discussed in courts. It's being um, also uh, uh, discussed uh, in terms of government regulations. Um, so, so that begs the question: Then, what is meat? And I'll try and address that question uh, at the end. The second thing is that there's also a trend um, that fall into the alt protein space. Uh, which are products that are um, blends. So in other words, um, they're blended meats. So it's 50% meats and then 50% alt protein. Um, and so that also raises the question as to how to label these things. I mean, they could be labeled as meat products uh, since they do contain meat. Uh, and as for cell-based meat, the question also is raised about uh, the fact that they do use animal cells to produce uh, tissues, to, to bioengineer tissues, um, that they might also be considered meat in the future. Right now they're not, but um, so that's, the, that's the, big, uh, the big question. So I just wanted to raise that right away and then we can have a further discussion uh, later on because again, these are very highly contentious uh, issues. So uh, a large part of the, of the market um, or of the alt uh, meat or alt protein uh, market um, centers around uh, issues of climate change. Uh, and these are some statistics that you all know that you've all seen before, uh, but they talk about um, the kind of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of shifting sort of consumption patterns in terms of people being more interested in switching their diets. Um, so so these, these future consumption patterns seem to indicate um, that you know, people going for more, more, more sort of vegetable, uh, plant-based or, um, or all protein um, fake meats 
um, that factors such as population growth uh, in developing countries in particular and demographic lifestyle changes uh, are important in this sort of shifting um, landscape. So this is what, uh, you know, um, the future of these uh, protein uh, uh, is saying. Um, and of course, uh, the demand uh, for these uh, all proteins um, is also coupled with uh, a higher demand for meat and meat products, which has also increased uh, due to higher incomes and changes in food consumption uh, brought about by urban lifestyles. So global meat consumption is actually on the rise uh, in, in, uh, sorry, in middle income countries, such as China uh, and other Asian countries uh, with a marked increase um, in the consumption of chicken and pork. On the other hand, as we know, meat consumption has plateaued or decreased uh, in developed countries. Um, so according to uh, the journal Science, uh, the types of meat consumed have shifted where people are starting to consume more chicken at the expense of beef, for instance, and maybe uh, at the expense of more processed uh, meats. So these, uh, these comments on the slide just give you a kind of idea of where, you know, um, uh, you know environmental sustainable, sustainability issues lie as far as, um, you know, livestock production and why there's such a shift and such a demand for uh, plant-based products or for alternative um, products, alternative protein products. So again, this slide uh, that I'm showing you now uh, indicates the, the, uh, the sort of growing demand uh, for, uh, for meat. Uh, the United Nations uh, Food and Agriculture Organization projects that uh, global meat consumption will rise by more than 1% this year. Um, and it also states that the, the fastest uh, growth will probably occur in low and middle income countries where the incomes uh, are sort of, you know, steadily climbing. So what's driving uh, this increase in meat and animal protein demand? Now I'm talking about meat and animal protein demand. Um, there's two key driving factors that have been identified one is population growth, as I've said before, and increased meat demand per person. So it means that um, uh, the, the richer uh, people are getting, the more meat uh, they tend to eat. So it's expected that as incomes rise um, in some countries, uh, per capita demand for meat and animal protein will also follow. And again, this is coupled with the impact of population growth uh, with more meat-rich dietary preferences and also a continued increase in global meat demand in the coming decades. So from one perspective, rise in animal protein intakes at lower incomes uh, in, sort of in lower, lower and middle income countries uh, is a sign of progress for them uh, because uh, diets uh, could be, you know, could have been traditionally or not traditionally, but since the advent of industrial agriculture, diets may have shifted and may have become uh, deficient in high quality protein. So, so the, the addition of meat for these, uh, in these countries may be an essential addition in terms of nutrients. However, as I've shown you in the slides before, from another perspective, uh, this rise in meat uh, demand will come at an environmental cost. And this is because livestock products are highly water intensive. Uh, again, I don't have to tell you all the statistics, you probably know them, but just for information, uh, per kilogram, uh, beef requires around 10 times more water than cereal crops. So this has important implications for food security as well. Uh, to produce one kilogram of beef requires around 25 kilograms of animal feed. Uh, and that means that globally 38% of cereals are fed to livestock. Uh, in some countries, this can reach up to half of all cereals produced. So definitely uh, an, a transformative shift has to occur, uh, a shift towards sustainable diets, uh, which is actually pushing the meat analog uh, market. 
So people like Bill Gates, for example, in his recent book that you may have read, although I don't know why you would buy it because uh, the man is, is rich. Um, in his recent book entitled How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, uh, Bill Gates, and he's just a representative of these sort of uh, Silicon Valley investors in alternative protein, um, uh, in, in the alternative protein uh, market, he recommends in his book that all rich countries should consume 100% synthetic beef. So he's pushing uh, plant-based meats and cellular meat as potential replacements. However, others are saying that it's unlikely to move people away from eating meat, uh, that their tastes uh, won't change, and that solutions should include supporting efforts to uh, develop alternative proteins, as well as low impact methods of livestock production. So both of these, both of these areas um, should really give us the best shot at uh, reducing agricultural environmental impact while still allowing people uh, to eat what they want. So in all cases, uh, it's clear that alternative meats or meat analogs can alleviate some of the problems associated with livestock production. Now, it's not the answer to everything, but it certainly is, um, is one step um, forward. So I'm gonna talk about plant-based uh, meats um, and give you maybe some of the reasons why um, plant-based alternatives have, uh, have been increasing. So, just to give you a bit of background information, uh, analysts uh, project that the market for plant-based uh, protein and uh, lab-created meat alternatives could be worth as much as $85 billion by 2030. According to the uh, National Research Council of Canada, uh, they did a, a, a sort of a study on uh, plant-based um, protein or alternative proteins, but it was mostly on plant-based. Uh, the market for alternative protein is predicted to grow at an annual rate of 14% uh, um, by 2024 to reach about a third of the country's entire protein uh, market. So up to, up to date, uh, more than 40% of Canadians have adopted uh, flexitarianism or reducitarianism uh, as a sort of a, a diet, meaning that they have reduced their uh, meat intake um, because they're concerned about sustainability issues, but also uh, because they're concerned about their health. And so they're taking these things into consideration. Uh, it seems that, uh, and of course, the, uh, the National Research Council of Canada um, report was written in 2019. So this was before the pandemic. And in, in fact, the pandemic um, has really kind of accelerated uh, the demand uh, for plant-based meat and for analogs in general, even cellular meat, even though cellular meat is not uh, yet commercialized. So um, the reason why coronavirus has accelerated demand is because um, there have been uh, shutdowns of meat plants and slaughterhouses uh, globally and also because uh, these shutdowns um, have also raised the profile, if you will, of food safety in terms of, um, but also in, uh, in addition, sorry, to sustainability and health. So again, uh, the pandemic has accelerated the demand and the production uh, of these types of foods. So there have been issues in the North American meat supply chain uh, with African swine fever episodes are reducing the um, availability of pork. Um, there have been episodes of avian flu, et cetera, et cetera. There have been closures uh, in the spring of 2020 of uh, 20 meat factories due to plant workers contracting the COVID virus. Um, and so all these things together have uh, generated interest in uh, alternatives of meat alternatives. Surveys also show that uh, when faced with out of stock items, as was the case for uh, pork uh, in the U United States in particular, uh, consumers uh, in, in China, consumers uh, would, be, would be more willing to switch to alternatives. 
And so what this does, what these um, out of stock uh, episodes uh, do is that they kind of nudge um, consumers towards developing uh, new shopping patterns. So the links uh, with the pandemics and eating animals uh, were made also uh, as the transmission of viruses between humans and animals was uncovered. And this sort of came to light uh, when the uh, COVID um, pandemic started with uh, discussions about how, where the virus originated uh, with uh, research uh, taking place in Wuhan. Um, and this sort of, you know, uh, transmission from human to animal in terms of, of uh, pandemics or or zoonoses, as it's called, uh, was linked uh, to past outbreaks of SARS, for example. Um, so all these things put together uh, contribute to people seeking out non-animal alternatives. So here you have on the slide, you have examples of these uh, plant-based meats. And of course, the most popular ones being impossible foods and beyond burgers, but they're not the only ones clearly, but they are the ones that people know because they're, they've sort of, you know, been adopted uh, in fast food uh, outlets, but also because in the supermarkets nowadays, uh, you can find them uh, next to the meat uh, in the, in the, uh, in the meat, uh, in the butcher uh, section. So, so these are, um, again, becoming I'm going to use again the, the word normalized, but uh, in quotation marks. Um, so <clears throat> a recent article uh, that was published in the New York Times asked the question, the new makers of plant-based meat, big meat companies, and here um, they, they list the Tyson, Smithfield, Purdue, Armel and this JBS and others uh, that are actually uh, investing uh, in a big way in plant-based uh, um, uh, meat alternatives. Um, so these major um, food companies um, are, are actually rolling out their own uh, meat alternatives. And, um, and so they, they're, they're um, you know, the, the question is why, why would they do that? I mean, these are, these are actual meat companies. Um, so the reason, and there are many reasons, <laughs> but uh, one of the reasons, and it's not on my, um, it's not in my notes for this slide for some reason, let me just um, check my other notes. Anyway, I'll just use it. I'll just tell you by memory because I'm trying to uh, be consistent here with my timing. But anyway, but uh, so the whole idea of the, of the sort of alt protein uh, market is to disrupt uh, the food system in general. Uh, the fact that these new uh, big meat companies or these big ag players are coming into that, that um, um, meat analog space uh, is really making the whole idea of disruption kind of um, kind of, uh, you know, secondary. Um, so the, the, so why would they invest in these uh, things? Because they see an opportunity, obviously, uh, because as I said, the, the market is, uh, is growing very quickly. Um, it's also because uh, some people have speculated that um, what these companies are doing is they're, they're also buying the technologies uh, that, um, that come with these um, the production of these uh, plant-based meats. They're buying up the startups that are developing the technologies. Um, and so they're acquiring all, these, um, all this knowledge. And some people are even saying that maybe they're buying up all the startups and eventually they'll sh just shut down the whole plant-based uh, industry like they did for, like the big oil companies did for the, um, the, the sort of renewable energy uh, sector. So these are some speculations about why um, this is happening. But, um, but it's important to understand that, um, that the, these big, uh, these meat companies and other big uh, food and ag companies um, um, are really interested in, uh, or at least they're, they're, um, they're capturing, uh, you know, the growth in the market. So, so definitely it's good for business uh, for them. Um, also, uh, another reason why they might be buying these companies uh, is because during the pandemic, 
uh, there, there were a lot of meat shortages. And so this disrupted the, the meat supply chain. So, so, so in other words, they, so they would, you know, because they, they're important players in the um, supply chain, they could easily switch to, uh, to the plant-based uh, products. Um, so in terms of the supply chain, uh, I just wanna maybe raise some issues or raise some points. Um, uh, because people are, are automatically thinking that because they're plant-based um, meats, uh, that they're automatically sustainable, um, that, um, that they're better for the environment and so on and so forth. And they're good arguments to, to support these ideas, but there are also some questions that need to be asked. Um, for example, uh, we know that uh, in the case of impossible foods, uh, that the soy that they use to uh, produce their burgers uh, comes from GM plants. It comes from genetically modified crops. Uh, Beyond Meat is the only one uh, clearly stating uh, that they do not uh, use uh, genetically modified products. Some other companies do it as well, but they're sort of minor players. Um, the other thing is um, plant-based companies are forging close relationships with protein suppliers. So Nestle recently announced uh, agreements with uh, Canadian protein suppliers uh, Birkin and Merit uh, Functional Foods. Um, and the Canadian federal government has invested $100 million in uh, uh, Merit Functional Foods for them to, uh, to build a processing plant. Um, and we know that Beyond Meat, for example, is an agreement with Roquette. Roquette is a French uh, ingredient supplier. Uh, we also know that Cargill, for example, has formed a joint venture with a U.S. Uh, pea protein producer called Purists. Uh, and they're also developing Cargill, believe it or not, um, non-GMO uh, soy, uh, soy protein products, uh, ingredients, in order to meet uh, consumer demand. So what this means is that uh, pulse proteins uh, will continue to be in demand, so peas, lentils, uh, beans, etc. Um, and this will create uh, stress on crop production because uh, some people are speculating that this means that some acreage will be reassigned to more legumes uh, and more um, you know, plant uh, vegetable matter that um, is used in the uh, creation of the vegetable uh, meat. So questions uh, you know, are asked about how will these changes affect uh, feed supply, for example. So as the demand for plant protein grows, uh, this has definitely will have impacts on the value chain. Um, we'll have to make sure that the plant-based uh, uh, burgers uh, keep their promise about sustainability um, and that, um, you know, a lot of the ingredients are not sourced from necessarily a monocultural um, or GM uh, uh, plants uh, or using techniques that are soil depleting or that use heavy amounts of pesticides or whatever, depending on what consumers are, are demanding. The other thing about uh, plant-based uh, meat claims uh, that, need to, that we need to question as consumers, um, as I said to you before, people are switching to uh, plant-based meats or they're including more and more plant-based uh, alternatives in their diets and not totally switching off uh, meat. Um, they're doing this for health reasons, uh, but, uh, and they also, you know, they're also switching away from eating as much meat because they're concerned about uh, hormones or antibiotics or other things in meat. However, um, these, uh, these burgers or these fake meats, as we know, is, are, are ultra processed uh, foods. They use very sophisticated high-tech science to reproduce uh, taste and texture of meats. So some of the ingredients are not as natural as they claim to be. Um, so the Impossible Burger, for example, the, the, the one that actually bleeds or looks like it's bleeding, uh, uses a, a leg hemoglobin um, a chemical or protein that 
in the plants. It's a, it's a vegetable heme molecules. Uh, it's, um, its safety has been put into question. Uh, people are saying there hasn't been enough testing to know uh, if this is safe or not. Um, and, and there have been some, some questions about the, uh, uh, the carcinogenic potential of this particular protein. Uh, nutritionists have also uh, questioned the high fat and the high salt uh, content of some of these products. Um, they've also questioned the, the safety of some of these uh, additives and preservatives that are used to, um, to uh, mimic uh, real, real meat, uh, the dyes, etc. And, um, you know, some people are saying uh, eating plant proteins such as pulses and nuts, for example, uh, is one thing, but eating vegetable bacon, for example, is another thing in terms of health. Because in the making of the vegetable bacon, you know, there's a whole bunch of processing and chemical adulteration that has to take place in order for it to look, taste, smell, and so on, uh, like bacon. So on the one hand, uh, the defenders of meat uh, say that unprocessed, home-cooked, grass-fed meat is more natural and more nourishing than a vegetable hot dog, for example. Um, the other issue is, is cost. Uh, impossible burger or impossible meats uh, has recently lowered its uh, prices because it's about double the price of, uh, of regular meat. Uh, it's ground beef um, um, is not cheap. A five pound family pack of, of uh, ground beef, and again, beef is a question mark, uh, is $65 US uh, versus in Canada, I'd have to do the, the, the translation or the, the um, you know, I'd have to uh, adapt it. But anyway, you get the, the gist of it. Uh, in Canada, uh, what a kilo of uh, ground beef is about $11 Canadian. So, I mean, what it works out to is about the fact that impossible meat is about double uh, the price of uh, regular meat. Um, so let me now talk about celery meat. Um, or celery Elizabeth, meat. just a, a time yep. check, Elizabeth, uh, 10 minutes to go. Wow, okay, I've been talking too slowly, which is very unusual for me, but um, <laughs> speed things up here. So basically, uh, cellular agriculture is this um, emerging field uh, of research, which is really at the intersection of biomedicine uh, and agriculture. Uh, here in cellular agriculture, uh, the focus is the cell. The cell is the production unit, not the animal. And um, really that uh, the, the idea is that uh, the, the, the processes that are involved are you know, able to uh, recreate uh, in bioreactors uh, in, in terms of the cell meat. So as I told you before, there's fermentation root and there's the cellular meat root. In the fermentation root, you can produce uh, eggs without chickens, milk without cows, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other hand, you have the cell meat, the cell-based meat. Um, so um, at the bottom of the slide here, you have a sort of an idea of the growth of the cellular meat space. You see that in 2016, you only had a few startups. And now in 20, this is a 2019, but 2021, there's, a, you know, the, the, there's about 30 to 50 players now worldwide uh, in terms of um, cellular meat. And uh, the, the term cellular agriculture is, is kind of contested because it uses the language of agriculture. Uh, it uses the terms like culture and harvesting and so on. So it makes it seem like it's an extension, like a natural extension of conventional agriculture, when in fact it's, uh, it has very little connections to rural worlds or little, yeah, because um, it really is pitched at, uh, to, to, sorry, it's, it's really pitched at uh, urban settings. Uh, it's, and the idea is that, you know, eventually there will be these meat factories that will be um, set up in the urban centers. And these meat factories will be modeled uh, along the, the, the idea of the brewery, uh, except they'll be called carneries or meat factories. So the possibilities of, um, of cell meat are endless because you can make, uh, you, can, you can use cells from uh, very, um, 
you know, from extinct species or rare species. You can make mammoth burgers if you can isolate stem cells and grow them into tissues. You can make hybrid burgers. You can have cow and chicken at the same time. And some bioartists have also said that you can, uh, you can also make uh, human burgers. Uh, why not? You can, you can make meat out of your own uh, stem cells. So, um, so nowadays, a number of companies around the world are, are, are working on developing cultured beef, chicken, pork, fish, seafood, for example. And they're really trying to bring those uh, products to market. There's also uh, pet foods. Last year, uh, Singapore uh, became the first country to give regulatory approval for cultured meat product for consumer sale. Uh, the Singapore Food Agency approved Eat Just's uh, Good Meat Cultured Chicken product made um, uh, by this company. Uh, and um, it grew basically uh, chicken cells in a bioreactor, uh, which is a device that supports an environment in which cells and tissues can be grown. And um, this, uh, these products are not really commercialized. They are proved to be sold in restaurants. Um, and in terms of the, the commercialization of these cell meats, it's not clear. Different estimates uh, say 2025 to 2030 is when we can expect to see them uh, um, in the marketplace. So um, just quickly, uh, you know, in vitro uh, meat, cell-based, cultured, clean meat, lab-grown, uh, meat 2.0. I mean, there's been a you know uh, slaughter-free meat, cruelty-free meat, humane meat. I mean, there are many, many ways of de describing this um, this uh, process here. But basically, without getting into uh, technical issues, uh, the idea is to grow uh, animal stem cells and to regenerate them uh, into uh, into tissues. Um, and, and basically uh, do this uh, not only in a Petri dish, but eventually do it in a bioreactor, in a 1200 liter bioreactor um, in order to fabricate uh, these, these living tissues. Uh, these, are, these are functional, biologically functional tissues, um, but they will be used for, for meat. So they will be edible um, tissues. This comes from the, uh, the uh, sort of science of regenerative medicine a lot of the people who started these companies are, um, are surgeons or are people involved in biomedical research. Uh, and so this is not surprising. So I won't get into the, the details of this, uh, this product because I don't have a lot of time. Um, so what are the claims uh, made by the industry? Uh, this slide gives you a very brief sort of, you know, idea of what the claims are. Um, the, in some cases, uh, people are saying that this will replace traditional meat, or at least that's what some of these companies want to do. Um, they will disrupt the, uh, the food system, uh, you know, and, and the industrial agricultural system, uh, a claim that is questionable. Anyway, you can read this, uh, these claims for yourself. And the idea also is that we can do it better than the cow. Uh, we can make better meat because we can tailor it to people's uh, nutritional needs. We can make it more like a pharmaceutical. We can add things for people who have dietary uh, restrictions and so on. Um, so um, the, other, the other claims, of course, is that, is that we can feed the world. So with one cell, we can actually feed the world. We can fix uh, climate change. We can fix food security issues. We can solve human health problems. We can alleviate human uh, animal suffering, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the industry uses narratives that, that are kind of like, you know, expressive of a kind of moral panic about the end of the world. Uh, but it also relies on engineering solutions to get us to, to get us out of our predicaments. So it's really based on this idea of techno utopia utopianism. Um, so it's, again, we're going to engineer the animal out of its own body. We're going to engineer ourselves out of, you know, the climate crisis. Um, and of course, its claims are that um, it is completely animal free. And that is questionable, again, because in order to grow the cells, uh, a lot of animal products are used. So, so fetal calf uh, serum or fetal bovine serum uh, is, is really uh, the main nutrient that actually allows the cells to grow and proliferate. And so 
far they have uh, advocates for, for this product. So the claim that this is slaughter-free uh, meat is actually not uh, born in, in truth. So there are many issues, there are many technical hurdles uh, that, uh, that uh, prevent this meat from being commercialized at the moment. I mean, many startups are working on this at the moment, but um, I won't get into the details and we can maybe bring that up during the discussion because I realize my time is, um, is limited. Yeah, about five more claims, minutes. Okay, so among some of the claims is that it is real meat, that uh, it, it actually in no uh, way will it be different from, from meat. And of course, that uh, hinges on a particular definition of what meat is. Um, you can break it down into these, uh, these different parts. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, we can, we can uh, discuss this also. Um, so finally, some thoughts. There are many sustainability issues linked with, uh, you know, alt, the alt protein uh, meats. Where are the ingredients coming from? Um, in the case of plant-based meats, uh, how are they produced? Are they produced sustainably? Are they monocultures? Are they GMOs? Other sustainability issues involved issues like labor, uh, social, other conditions in which the production uh, takes place. Are the supply chains uh, for making fake meats uh, sustainable? And how is this measured? In the case, in the case of plant-based meats, uh, what are the growth conditions and how do these affect nutritional value, for example? Uh, the processing, the meat processing, uh, it requires additional energy costs. So it may not actually be uh, so uh, environmentally friendly after all. In the case of cellular meat, um, you know, it, it, when I'm talking about processing, I'm, I'm talking about as opposed to whole foods, for example, whole grains or that kind of thing. In terms of cellular meat, uh, what are the environmental impacts of large scale cell meats? Uh, right now they're unclear. And the scale up as you know, as this process uh, becomes industrialized and it goes into manufacturing, uh, it's gonna be using a lot, it's gonna require a lot of energy and water. Uh, and also the fact that it's not yet animal free. With regards to nature, uh, what will be the environmental costs of these meat factories? Uh, recent uh, studies, the one in Oxford in particular shows that uh, lab meat uh, will produce fewer greenhouses gases over the short term, but this will catch up because, um, um, uh, excuse me, because so, so that, yeah, so they'll, they'll produce methane, uh, they'll produce CO2, excuse me, as opposed to methane, which is what uh, livestock production uses. And that um, the problem is that methane is 25 times more potent in terms of its potential to contribute to global warming, but it leaves the atmosphere within 12 years as opposed to uh, CO2, which takes a century to leave um, the atmosphere. So there's a complete lack of life cycle assessments of environmental sustainability of all uh, alt proteins. Uh, and I won't go on into these other things. I'll let you read this quotation from the MIT Technology Review, which came out uh, this week or last week, um, which questions uh, the fact that, you know, these things are gonna replace the, uh, you know, the, the meat industry. I also wanna raise the question of language and labels. What is meat? What is processed? What is clean versus, you know, when, when you talk about cell meat as being clean meat, or uh, plant-based as being clean food or clean eating, what does that imply that meat is dirty and so on? So it's creating these, uh, these narratives. Uh, it's creating these good versus bad farmers and farming. Uh, language like animal-free, slaughter-free, cruelty-free, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so these are all questions that we need to ask. Uh, in terms of what is meat, uh, clearly uh, meat uh, is, is defined in Canada as being the edible part of a carcass. So um, does that mean that cellular meat uh, can't use the term meat? Um, that's a question and same with the plant-based um, um, uh, burgers. So, um, so all these questions are really important. Um, so Canada, the CFIA has this category called simulated meat products that could possibly, you know, 
encompass these plant-based uh, meats. So, but the whole the whole marketing of uh, of these products is is really put into question. So finally, um, I just want to say that um, it turns out because I think I'm running out of time. Um, that it's not just about what you eat, but how it's produced that also matters. So I think that we need to keep that, that in mind. So um, personally, I don't see the end of animal agriculture. I think that the uh, cellular meat and the plant-based meats are going to uh, take up uh, larger parts of, um, of the sort of food uh, market and in particular plant-based meats, not so much cellular meats, because as I said, they're still experimental in some ways, you know, they haven't, um, and, and then, you know, the best we can do are nuggets and, and burgers in terms of cellar meat. Um, so I think that, um, so yeah, I think that I'm pretty optimistic about um, animal agriculture. Um, you know, uh, if it's done, you know, better, I'm sure we can improve things to make it more sustainable. And I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hope we can have some good, good discussion.